Good morning. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Good to see everyone here and present, and good to see all who are joining us over Zoom or watching us later. Your presence here is just as important as those who are sitting in the pews. We are doing communion this morning, so if you are at home or watching us later, if you want to grab something to drink and something to eat so that you can take communion with us, please do so. Let us come into worship by starting with lighting the peace candle. The peace candle has been lit. It is a let's start over. The peace candle has been lit. It is a custom in our congregation to light our peace candle during worship as a witness to the Prince of Peace and our communal intention to be peacemakers as a just peace church. This morning's reading is a famous sonnet. How do I love thee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I asked a few in the congregation if they could help me in how to properly recite this poem. Um, so I'll do my best. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and the height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion to put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Mm -hmm. With that reading, may you pass the peace. Greet your neighbors <laughs> with a symbol and a sign. The scripture reading this morning is from the Song of Solomon 2, 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Sermon scripture taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. 
On the third day, there was a wedding in the Canaan of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They don't have any more wine. He replied, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby were six stones, water jars, used for the Jewish ritual cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some from them and take it to the head waiter. And they did. The head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from. Oh, the servants who had drawn it, the water knew. Head water, the head waiter called to the group and said, everyone who serves a good wine first, they bring out the second great wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You have kept the good wine until now. Now this was the first miracle, miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. We are talking about open and affirming in all types of families. This week we're going to hear a little story called My Two Moms. Hello, I'm Suri. I'm nine years old and my favorite color is pink. I'm Surik, also nine, and I love green. And we are twins. We are here to tell you about our two moms, Ama and Mata. Our moms are the greatest moms ever, except when they baby us in the park. We are not babies anymore. But no matter what, they get, du they get double love because we are twins. We like doing things such as going to plays. Anna loves taking us to different cultural events. Yeah, she keeps us talking about exposing us to the world. And we like going on hikes up the mountains. Mata likes to keep us super active. Yeah, she tries to make us tired, but it never works. <laughs> I am the more adventurous twin. I like to be outside all day if I could. Mata keeps asking me to run with her, but she would only slow me down. Not me. I like drawing and writing songs. Ama says I am the critical thinker. And I don't know really what that means. <laughs> Friends at school really like our moms, and we don't mind sharing, as long as our moms know we come first. And after school, we do our homework, and if we are good, watch a show. Then we read a book, wash our bodies, and go to bed. We do a lot as a family, and a family is about sharing love. Our moms are always there for us, giving us our best life. But, Mata and Ama, you are the best part of our lives. In my 20 years of ministry, 20 plus, the most excited and animated I ever saw a group of people talking about my sermon was after I was talking about personal testimony. And I said something like this, yes, per faith is personal, but it's not private. 
We should talk about our faith. It's not like I'm asking you to talk about sex. <laughs> and the consensus of the group after church was they much rather me talk about sex <laughs> than personal faith. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, which we sometimes use, which our pastor relations committee is reading one of his book, Working the Angles, also wrote a book called Five Smooth Stones for Pastoral Ministry. And in one of the chapters, he talks about a Red Book survey. Now, Red Book is a survey that often asks about sex for women, because women talk about it. And it said, and it, they found a real interesting thing that those who rated themselves highly religious also said they had the most satisfying sex life. And he surmised from this that, of course, the more we are open to God, the more we feel valued and the more we feel loved and the more we care for each other, of course, we're going to have that relationship with our partner as well. So why wouldn't it be? So a few years later, I was at a meeting, I can't remember if it was a conference meeting or a general synod meeting, and, and we were there strategizing, how can we start getting people back into worship? And I remembered that book, and I remembered that quote, that study, and I said, well, maybe we should put up some billboards. Want a better sex life? <laughs> Join a <the> church. <laughs> Another author and writer, who some of you may know, Timothy LaHaye. Now, a lot of you may know that name from the Behind series, which he wrote in the 2000s. But he was also, in the 70s, a pastoral counselor. And he wrote a book called The Act of Marriage. And in his book, he said, this is why we get married, so that we can have sex. And sex is the greatest gift that we can give anyone, anytime, as long as it's in the marriage. Okay, from now on, I'm going to say it instead of, because probably most of you have not heard a pastor say in the pulpit, and we don't want any more blood pressure to come up. <laughs> but in our culture, there's a lot of emotion around it. There's a lot of um, triggers around it. There's a lot of, ooh, can we or can't we do the do we? And, and there's a lot of using it for purpose other than nurture, intimacy, building friendships and relationships and trust. And there's a lot of baggage with the religious people that sex is something vile and disgusting that you save for someone you love. <laughs> supposed to say it. So what is it? Is it something that's ugh, vile and disgusting, or is it the greatest thing that God ever gave us? I'm thinking it's a gift, but probably not the greatest one. In the Song of Solomon, this book if you look at most of the historical writings of most of the historical church fathers, they would say, oh, if I had a chance to take a book out of the Bible, it would be this one. <laughs> What's this doing in the Bible? This, And then they try to change it and say, well, it's not about two lovers. It's about us and Christ and the passion we have for being together at the final time. During the end times. But if you read the whole thing, no, it is. It's about love. And it's about desire. And it's about seeing the goodness of the bodies that God has created. And enjoying in that. And desiring that. And relishing the one they love. For the most part... The Bible doesn't have a lot of negative stuff to say about it itself. In the Ten Commandments, we have the seventh, I think, sixth or seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. It doesn't say thou shalt not do it. Thou shalt say, say, 
says, thou shalt not do it with somebody else if you are in already in a covenant relationship. And in our story today in the gospel, Jesus isn't saying, oh, thank God they got married. And that's, he's like, let's celebrate. Now, they've probably been having this wedding for party for a few days. And it's going to go for a few days more. They asked it maybe up to two weeks, depending on the resources that the families could put together. And so Jesus first kind of pushes them away, but then he gives them the best wine before later. Let's keep the party going. Let's keep the celebration going. Let's keep the love flowing. And when confronted with things, Jesus, like prostitutes, he doesn't condemn, he shows compassion. When confronted with adultery, again, he doesn't condemn, he shows compassion, and he says, please keep to what you promised. And in marriage, he isn't saying, oh, marriage is the bad, best of a bad situation. He is saying, let's celebrate their love, their passion for each other, their future, their families, their place in the world and in our village. So in times of culture, different cultures and, and different periods of history, we have lots of different views of how this was accepted and how the practices were within that community, within that society, within that religion of how to do it. Now the pilgrims, they kind of took the kind of slow, well, well, let's keep it at hand, this type of, you know, it's, it's for procreation only type of thing, you know, but if you go and look at the records from the early pilgrims, a lot of babies were born six months after the marriage. And if you look at the Puritans, especially, you know, in Eastern Pennsylvania, Go and look up the small town names. Often preachers in the Puritan, the Puritan churches there used it as a way to say this. Well, you enjoyed it. Why don't you wait until you get to heaven? It's going to be so much better. <laughs> Go up, look at their names. They have some really weird names down there related to it. But in our culture, in this today, in society, through the media, the image and the values that they try to portray is that it is best when it's a one night stand or a weekend tryst. It is something dangerous. It is something new. It is something exciting. And it is better when he is built like a chiseled God, and she is absolute perfect body dimensions. And we don't have to have love, and we don't have to have commitment, and we don't have to have society, and we don't have to have anything. It is just those two. And that is the best time for doing it. But most of those stories, and most of those images, and most of those things, finally get to the place where, yeah, if it's going to last, it's going to be surrounded by family and friends, and it's going to have some kind of, of a commitment, and that couple will be in the wider society and the culture to fit in. And we remember that from two weeks ago that all bodies are beautiful. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, your body is beautiful. Heck yeah. <laughs> now we're, we're in a little shorter time period, so I can't kind of talk about things that go wrong and things that are not. I want to kind of focus on the positive and the blessing of it, but we have to 
acknowledge that it is sometimes used for wrong ways and people get hurt when they enter a relationship and society uses it to sell you your car, your refrigerator and <laughs> anything else that they think, hey, let's throw a beautiful person there and everybody's gonna wanna be with them. And so they will buy this product. But we know, we know to be in a healthy relationship trust and love and vulnerability needs community. A relationship cannot exist in a vacuum. And within our series, LGBTQA+, being open and affirming, we need to help supply that community because a lot of society, a lot of other churches say that that relationship is wrong. It is not conforming to what we believe is the absolute perfect relationship. So we need to be a community that helps to nurture, that helps to support, and that helps them to grow as individuals, as a couple, as a family, as a part of God's kingdom. And remember, it's not about the mechanics. It's not about who is allowed to love who. If we look next week, we're going to look at families and how we define families. And one of the authors I'm reading right now on sensuous spirituality, she has gone through, she has gone through the Bible meticulously, and she has found 40 different types, dozens of different types of families that exist, that are part of God's story, that are part of Israel, that are part of Jesus' time, that are part of our world. God has blessed us in so many ways. God has created so many good things. And God has given us this gift to be enjoyed, to be played, to be loved, to snuggle, to have a person you can count on and relate to and love and be loved in return. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's a God amazing thing. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
So here was talking to our youth group on Wednesday night, and he was talking to them a little bit about over in Tibet and how if you you are sitting alone in a Tibetan watch and they will sit right beside you and they will make contact with you because they don't want you to be alone. Even if there's 50 seats out there, they won't come in right next to you. And that's very uncomfortable for us Americans because we like our rights. And some people are really thriving right now because of social distancing. <laughs> But we are an incarnational church, theology, religion, following, bodies are good, the world is blessed. We do not just think about spiritual things, but we think about all things, in all, with all, through all, the spirit flows. And so this meal is to remind us that we are human beings. We are humans. We are created in the God's image. We are a part of a wider body. We are not alone. We are loved. We are cared for. We are fed. We are healed. We will have our communion here, as we have been doing it outside, where we will pass it around. We ask that when you take the bread that you hold it so that we may take it together to remind us that we are all part of the body. We are all part of God's kingdom. And then when you get the, the juice, the cup, I ask that you take it immediately to remind yourself that you have a relationship. You're not just one of all many we are all together, but you are also God's <laughs> child. You are also loved. You are also fed. Even when you are alone, our feet of alone. So Christ, when he was there on his night of betrayal and desertion. He took bread before the meal and gave it to his disciples and says, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this cup is the new covenant. As long as you drink it in remembrance of me, by eating this bread, drinking this cup. I was very careful with that. <laughs> we become and are part of God's world, Christ's body, a fellowship. Let us pray. Mighty and merciful God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, your church, that we may be salt and light and leaven for the furtherance of your will in all the world. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The uh, communion bread is gluten, dairy, soy, <laughs> meat, <laughs> cheese, free.
covenant given to you. Take and drink. Of the covenant offered to you all. Oh, dear Scott, we ask you to we thank you for the gifts that we have received. We thank you for giving us ways to love and cherish each other, ways to break bread together, reminders of your love for us. And the love we have for each other. All this we ask in Jesus' name. We give you thanks through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we come into a time of prayer. We lift up balls upon our prayer list. Uh, we had two new people to be added, uh, Bruce Tyler, who not many of Bruce and Nancy. Um, he's been he's been he's tested positive this week for COVID, so mild symptoms, but he's asked for prayers. And then he first asked for his brother Eric, who had surgery on his neck on Wednesday for healing and recovery. Um, we keep Bob the champ. In our prayers, and I ask for prayers on Friday. I got a phone call that my older sister has been diagnosed with early stages of breast cancer. So it's, yeah. we don't know too much so far. All the news is fairly good that it, yes, it is cancer, but it's going to be treated.
greetable and all that. So we ask for prayers that that continues. Let us come into prayer. By the merciful God, we have a lot of work to do. To get work over our fears and our hangups. To unlearn what maybe the church or our culture has taught us. That making love is a part of your kingdom. Part of families, part of relationships. Help us to treat our partners with love and respect, cherish, help us to honor those who have healthy relationships. with support, with recognition, with your blessing as we are called to bless. You have the bows in our hearts and minds who are in need of healing, who are in need of love, who are in need of you something beyond ourselves. So if it blows upon our prayer list, Meredith, Vicki, Paul, Paulette, Larry, Steve, Frank, Bruce, Eric, Bob, my sister Chris, at the Pashadins and the Wilson Care Center, Eleanor, Noah, Lou, and Bev. Hear us as we pray the prayer as taught by your son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive us our trespasses. We are in the midst of our we are in the midst of our stewardship campaign, and so uh, one of our new board members, Carol Winter, is going to talk a little bit about stewardship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to just read you a short reflection on stewardship called Who Inspires You? I'd like to tell you about a woman who has inspired me from time to time with her faith and generosity. She wasn't wealthy or well-connected. There aren't any concert halls or schools or hospitals or parks named after her. Not much is known about her personal life. She was a widow, and her late husband's family was responsible for her welfare. It isn't clear whether she had any descendants. And yet for the last 2000 years, people have heard of her, including all of us. Remember the poor widow making an offering at the temple? Jesus pointed her out. He said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything all she had to live on. Wow. I used to think of her as kind of a side player, that she was put in the story for a contrast. It felt like Jesus' bigger point was to shame the wealthy. But over the years, my views have changed. She was bold. What courage and strength it must take for someone to give as she did. What faith she must have had to give everything she had. She must have believed wholeheartedly in what she did. How would her late husband's family, on whom she was dependent, react to that? 
Might she have to go without their protection or food? Her story provokes a lot of questions. Like, could I do what she did? What do I have to lose? What is a personally meaningful contribution? And what does this particular church mean to me and to Grand Marais? What can I do to help it thrive? Who else inspires us to be the church, the hands and feet of Christ in the world? And now, I think the next thing is, uh, next is, is news of uh, the church at work. Um, and there are lots of announcements in the bulletin. Um, I won't read all of them, but I'll highlight a couple of them. Um, Board of Directors meets Tuesday at 5. People are welcome to join if they like. Also at 7 on Tuesday is Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light on Zoom uh, about uh, what we can do locally to uh, start addressing climate change. Wednesday at 10, Bible Study of Isaiah, Finance Committee at 2. Um, at 7 on Wednesday is Gospel Hour, exploring the Gospel of Luke. Thursday at 10 is Tai Chi in the Fellowship Hall, and 4 o'clock is Pastor Relations Committee. 8 o'clock Friday morning, Harbor Watch. And at 5 p.m. Saturday is the Transgender Day of Remembrance Service. Um, do we need to say anything more today about getting ready for Thanksgiving? Uh, here. <laughs> Um, good morning. We, uh, as you know, we're doing Thanksgiving. We're doing it on a pickup or delivery basis. So we're taking reservations. Helen is in charge of that. We currently have 56 reservations. Wow. We are um, planning for 100 meals, although, to be honest, we're going to have a few more than that. And while we're asking, while we are asking for reservations, we're certainly not going to turn somebody away if they happen to show up and want a meal or two. However, um, if you haven't made your reservation yet, please do so. Or if you know somebody that you might that might want to have a meal or two or however many, please uh, have them let Helen know. Helen's got her list, by the way, today. She takes it everywhere she goes. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can, you can see her and sign up. So. <laughs> Second thing, um, thank you to all who have volunteered so far, as usual, for this event. Our volunteers come not only from this church, but from the wider community. John Bacher is our volunteer um, coordinator. We're in good shape, but as I tried to make the point very ineffectively in the interview last Wednesday on the radio, many hands make, and then I went blank. I couldn't remember <laughs> what the rest of that phrase was. <laughs> make light work. And so uh, if you're able to help, in one area we have still have a particular need and that is for turkey carvers. Uh, right now, we've only got a couple, and we've got, I think, six turkeys. So not that we need six carvers, but we do need more carvers. So if you're able to do that, please see John or let me know either one. So, thank you. One question. The dinner we reserve, we take home to eat. We don't eat it. You don't, we don't eat it here. You take it home. So far, every, almost everybody is. So they pick them up. I think we have one or two deliveries. No, you take it home and eat it there. We're not eating together. Next year. <laughs> and now may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God lift up his face to you this day and grant you peace. Amen.
off to get a strap.